For those of you unfamiliar to what is National Postdoc Appreciation Week, so this is a celebration of our postdocs, usually uh, established for one week, but at MSK we take it very seriously, so we extend it for almost the entire month of September, and we've been doing that for a few years. One of our emblematic events is the one that you are going to attend today, which is the postdoc slam. And with that, I also want to tell you what else is on the works for you. During National Postdoc Appreciation Week, we celebrate the postdocs in-house with celebrations, receptions, a lot of speaking engagement, but we also feature them internally so that our colleagues could get a sense of who is doing the amazing research that this institute is doing on a daily basis. We work together with the communications teams, and we work usually on a few profiles for our postdocs, and you could read them. These are uh, longer profiles. You get to see and read about their interests and passions and science, and what got them to be doing science and MSK, and of course, what do they want to do when they grow up? That's kind of like how we ever do it. In academia, I mean, grow up in academia, right? <laughs> so go show their love. Uh, these profiles are in one MSK and they are very inspirational, but it's also, it, it showcases their personality, so it's a fun read. Um, and they will be deploying like one, uh, one profile per day over the next couple of days. Then our colleague, in, uh, Dr. Ina Bagman Sanchez, also goes above and beyond and creates social media profiles of another handful of our postdocs. And for those of you that might not know the exact number, um, at the current moment, we have about 470 postdocs at MSK. So these 14 people in this slide is just, again, a subset of them and, and is our way of showcasing how international how interdisciplinary and how amazing our postdoc community is. We're very intentional in picking also from different disciplines, so you have a whole range of what's happening here in terms of the science. These profiles are shorter because they are designed for social media, and I hope that if you are on Twitter, I refuse to call it by that other name, um, you amplify them, you celebrate them, and most importantly, you get to know them because they are also your colleagues. And to all of those that volunteer to say yes for this profile, thank you. Furthermore, on Thursday, we have our biggest internal research symposium for the postdoctoral community. This is our annual postdoctoral research symposium. It's a collaboration between the Office of Postdoctoral Affairs and the Postdoctoral Association, and it's a terrific event. We start at 10 a.m. We have two sessions for oral presentations where 12 postdocs are going to present their very cutting edge research. And it's like the best day of research in this place because these are papers that are either coming really soon or were published. So you get a front seat on what's happening there. And we also have a poster session in the middle of the day where you could learn also about some other research, amazing as well, that is being conducted by, I think, about 30 postdocs in that poster session. Then in the afternoon, we invited Dr. Valentina Greco from Yale University to give the keynote. And these keynotes are very special to us because it's not your typical come and dump on the science you've been doing, but it's more of like take us to your career trajectory, the ins and outs that we don't read on your website about how you became a scientist. So we hope that you're here to support your colleagues, but also to come in the afternoon to hear more about what Dr. Greco has to share with us. All right, now get to business. <laughs> so it's my very pleasure to introduce Dr. Ushmaniel, who is going to carry us through the postdoc slam part. Thank you, Yahara, and happy postdoc appreciation week to everyone, especially to the postdocs. All right, so what is a slam? Well, this is our sixth year of doing a postdoc slam. Um, we've had over 60 presenters, um, 115 people who tried out for it, but this is at its essence a science communication event. Postdocs have three minutes and one slide with no animations, no laser pointers. There's also a lot of rules, no rapping, no singing, no poetry, et cetera, in order to convey the excitement of their work to a non-specialist audience. 
all of us have to spend a significant amount of time explaining what it is we do to somebody we meet on an airplane, scientists as well. So they're gonna be judged on content, presentation skills, and overall delivery, and it's for some money. Uh, so the first place winner will get $3,000 second place, third place, and then there is also a people's choice that you all will help us to determine. I'd like to take this moment to thank our judges. Uh, the three judges of the finals are uh, also board members here at MSK, so they give their time abundantly to us, and so I'd like to recognize Jeffrey Canada, Margaret Keene, and Alexander Robertson. Thank you so much for joining us today. I do not believe they accept bribes, but you can try. Okay. Um, and also, to get us to this point, we had two institutional colleagues who helped us narrow it down to these 10 finalists, and that includes Deb Burns and Aaron McDonough, and Aaron is here with us today as well. So thank you for, for your efforts. All right, I'd also like to make a giant shout out to so many other people who helped us to get here. The development office, I think see a strong showing from our development colleagues, design and creative services, the communications team, as well as the digital teams. All right, but uh, without further ado, let us get started with this phenomenal set of postdocs who you're gonna hear from for three minutes each and you can see them here. We will show this slide again right before you all judge for your favorites. All right, you arrived just in time to hear them start. Okay, so we're going to start with Dr. Swathi Jain, who is a postdoc in the lab of Luke Morris, and she is going to be talking about a biological ADT security system that flags cancer cells for immune attack. Have you guys seen those videos of a bear breaking into a house? No one really welcomes such uninvited guests or any kind of safety threat for that matter. So many of us spend a lot of money on home security services like ADT, which offers 24 seven monitoring and surveillance. What if I tell you that one such uh, ADT security system is installed free of cost in every cell of our body to protect us from any threat? infection or cancer. This biological ADT system works by constant sampling of proteins made inside the cell by chopping them into short fragments and displaying these fragments on the surface of the cell, shown as flags here, so that they can be visible to the patrolling immune cells, AKA our body's safety guards. Now, if these flags are derived from normal proteins, like in a healthy cell, they will appear as green flags to the immune system, reflecting the healthy state of the cell, in which case everything looks good to the immune cells. But with cancer, due to numerous genetic mutations, abnormal proteins are produced, which when processed by cells ADT system generates several red flags, making the immune cells rush to attack the cancer cells. So this red flagging is like cells calling 911, asking for help. Sadly, this ADT-coupled immune defense system often gets impaired as cancer progresses. But the good news is that knowing the precise details of these red flag elements, one can design precise cancer therapeutics. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I have shown only few flags here. But in a real scenario, there may be thousands and thousands of them, and only a small number of them might serve as potent cancer targets which can effectively catch the attention of the immune system. So here comes my job. In my lab, I computationally predict a whole bunch of these red flag elements and screen them for immune response in a super mouse model having human-like ADT system to shortlist the best cancer targets from a huge list. And I'm thrilled to tell you that I recently discovered some unique cancer targets which I could also identify in patient samples. This indicates their potential as targets for cancer therapy, which I'm currently working on developing. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Swathi. All right, it is now my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Zaki Abumrad, 
who is a postdoc in the lab of Vivian Tabar in our neurosurgery department. And he will be talking about the harmony behind the noise, how glioma macrophages sing their own tune. Imagine for a minute that you're in Washington Square Park on a nice spring day. The sun is shining, the park's in full bloom, it's all perfect. On the other side, a musician is setting up their accordion and you can't wait to hear them play. That is, until you're bombarded with a cacophony of sounds. Shrieking children, a bluesy bass trio, someone playing their mixtape way too loud. It's impossible to make sense of the chaotic noise. In a similar way, the different cell populations in glioblastoma, a lethal brain tumor, function just like these unique musical personalities in the park. Of interest to us, in our lab, is a type of immune cell called macrophages with diverse functions, yet uncharted, or songs, and they can make up up to 50% of the tumor itself. So what are these cells even doing, and how can we identify the songs that they're playing? So to understand the function of a cell, usually we look at the genes it expresses. And we can think of these genes as musical notes. So by sequencing, we can have the entire scope of notes or genes that these macrophages can play. However, that does not mean that we know what they're playing. We can make more sense of these genes by trying to look at which genes go together. This is more or less easy because, similar to how notes harmonize in chords, some genes also harmonize and can have correlated expression. So we started with a bunch of random notes, and now we have our chords. But we still don't know how and in what order these notes and chords are being played. This is where epigenetics comes in, which allows us to understand how genes regulate and affect each other. We use this to build a hierarchy or order for our genes, giving us even more structure to the noise. So notes, chords, order, timing, that's it. We have our melody, we're done. Well, unfortunately not quite, because all these macrophages, well, they're not even playing the same song. So what different songs are being played and how do we know which one to care about? So thankfully, thanks to single cell technologies, we have better hearing now. So by sequencing different tumors at different stages and some normal brain, we are able to both identify our song and musician of interest. So now that we developed this method, what did we find? Well, we found a song that we've heard before. Turns out these macrophages are not the original composers that we thought they were. They like to sample from different places in the body. You know how like the alphabet songs sound suspiciously like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? It's kind of the same thing. But what does that even mean? Well, that's what we're working on now. And hopefully in the near future, I can come back and tell you all about it. Thank you. Lyrical. Right. Okay. All right. Um, it's always so impressive to me how much information you can actually get across in three minutes, right? It feels like it should be so much less than that. All right. Now let's get ready for something different. I'm uh, thrilled to be able to introduce you to Dr. Heishua Wang, who is a postdoc in the lab of John Petrini. His talk is on the blueprint to disaster, alarms hijacked by cancer cells. All yours. So imagine our body as a city where all the cells are the houses then DNA is the blueprint of the entire city. Well, each cell in our body actually carries the exact same DNA, but it is able to guide the formation of different tissues and organs. The DNA achieved this remarkable feat by folding itself in unique ways that only specific zones become accessible in each different organ. It is like selectively revealing portions of the blueprint to specialized architects so that they can focus on their own expertise, like building a park or a hospital. So DNA is crucial to our life, but it's also very vulnerable. It has been estimated that in each cell in our body, up to 100,000 DNA damage events happens every day. But don't worry, we're not doomed, because there are DNA supervisors like MR11, which work diligently repairing the daily wear and tear in DNA. But once these DNA supervisors are off duty, DNA damage and subsequent mutations are more likely to accumulate. So today we know that DNA damage is the leading cause of cancer. But whatever the mutation is, a normal cell does not transform into a cancer cell overnight. And the journey 
between the initial DNA damage to the eventual full-blown cancer remains a mysterious journey. So to unravel this mystery, we culture many breast organs in our lab and trace their evolution. We found that normal breast cancers, normal breast cells initiate a defensive system after oncogene activation, where the DNA ingeniously reorganizes itself to control cell expansion. However, when the DNA supervisors, like the MR11 in this case, is malfunctional, DNA damage persists, and it activates a weak chronic immune response, which aberrantly packages DNA so that the cells lose the defensive system and become more susceptible to cancer transformation. But there's a hope, because we identify a sensor of these bad alarms called IFI-205. So before, this is like you crumble the blueprint to the architecture so that the architecture cannot read it properly, leading to a city filled with unsafe buildings. But now, by silencing this, uh, by silencing this sensor, we can silence the alarm and smooth, smooth out the blueprint uh, correct the aberrant DNA packaging. In doing so, the cells restain, restore the defensive uh, mechanism and restore the resistance for cancer transformation. So our study shows how the immune response can be hijacked by the cancer cells at the initiation stage. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Much appreciated. All right, uh, it's now a thrill for me to be able to introduce you to Dr. Magdalene Panagiotakopoulos, who is a postdoc in the lab of Dan Heller in our molecular pharmacology program. She is going to be talking to us about curing the cure to cancer. Hello. The troubles of a cancer patient aren't always over when their cancer cure is found. Why? Because many cancer therapies have very serious, even life-threatening side effects. What if I told you, for example, that up to 80% of patients who receive a bone marrow transplant end up with damage in their kidneys? Kidneys and bone marrow, let's see how that happened. So in bone marrow transplantation, the diseased stem cells in the bone marrow of a cancer patient are replaced by healthy stem cells by a donor. This is a successful treatment for many blood cancers, but it suffers from one big immune complication. Very often, the new stem cells coming from the donor are attacking the healthy tissues of the recipient. This is called graft-versus-host disease. Graft-versus-host disease attacks, among other major organs, the kidneys, our, our body's blood filtration system. And anyone here who's ever waited desperately in a bathroom line knows how fast and how hard our kidneys work. Now, kidney injury after bone marrow transplantation is unfortunately very common, even among children, and it increases both patient morbidity and mortality. However, right now there are no FDA-approved drugs for kidney injury of any kind. Why? Because none of those tested drugs have been able to accumulate in the kidneys in a concentration high enough to have a therapeutic effect. So my job is to make sure the desired drugs can reach the kidneys efficiently so that the kidneys recover fast from injury after bone marrow transplantation. Uh, in order to do that, I started with a mouse model of graft-versus-host disease where I showed that the kidneys of those mice become very inflamed and do not function properly. I also identified molecular pathways that could be good drug targets to reverse this injury. Then I designed lipid nanoparticles that encapsulate an anti-inflammatory drug targeting those pathways involved in kidney injury. Those lipid nanoparticles that are very similar to what we know from COVID vaccines were also decorated with a targeting lipid that binds to proteins overexpressed on the surface of those diseased kidney cells. The nanoparticle size, their charge, and the targeting lipids help them accumulate in the diseased kidneys of those mice deliver the anti-inflammatory drug, which in turn reduce inflammation and restore the kidney function. Now, we know that the kidneys are the collateral damage of many other cancer therapies used in the clinics. So we hope that this technology with minor adaptations could improve the life of thousands of cancer patients, even after their cancer is cured, so that their only kidney-related worry is how fast this bathroom line is moving. <laughs> Thank you. All right.
right. Um, I am very pleased to introduce you to Dr. Tata Kavlashvili, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Aniel Sphere. She's going to be talking to us about coffee shops being the powerhouses of New York. Um, our bodies are made up of billions of cells, all with crucial tasks to keep the important body systems running. And all of this requires tons of energy. So let's think of our cells as cities. If your cell is New York City, then your mitochondria will be like your coffee shops. They fuel New Yorkers with the morning energy that they require. Now, the blueprint of this energy production is mitochondrial DNA. And it's going to be the focus of my talk today. So think about it like an espresso machine in a coffee shop. Very rarely, inherited disorders in some humans are going to lead to damage of mitochondrial DNA. And this impairs with its ability to produce energy. So think of this as an espresso machine shutting down in a certain coffee shop. The coffee shop and the employees are all there, but none of them can serve the coffee to the customers that the customers require for the energy. Um, so imagine if only 20% of your coffee shops were to shut down, like Java House is not serving coffee. I'll go to Mato, I'll go to Starbucks, I'll still get my latte. But now imagine if 80% of coffee shops in New York were to overnight shut down. It would be really hard to source the energy we all need in the mornings. This is exactly what happens in brain and muscle in individuals who are suffering from mitochondrial diseases. They accumulate that 80% mitochondrial shutdown, which impairs the ability of brain and muscle to produce energy. And it leads to rare, often lethal neurodegenerative disorders that lead to muscle weakness, progressive blindness. But I know I've scared you. There's nothing special you need to do to protect your brains and muscles. This is a very rare genetic event. Nonetheless, it's really important for us to study and understand as scientists how it occurs. So my job in the lab as a postdoc is to understand why the brain and muscle accumulate this mitochondrial dysfunction to that 80% level. And in order to understand how something happens or how anything happens, you first have to create it in a perfect lab environment. So my job number one is to create mitochondrial DNA damage in brain and muscle and ask how cells respond to it. An eventual goal is to get the brain and muscle to notice and fix their dysfunctional mitochondria. Or in city terms, it would get New York to notice and fix all the broken espresso machines so we never get to the point where 80% of the coffee shops are shut down because that would be really bad for us postdocs who require our morning lattes. And our goal with this research and our hope is that first we will understand what's happening inside these cells inside the mitochondria when the DNA is damaged, and then take that mechanistic knowledge and leverage it in order to design better and more targeted treatments for humans who are actually suffering from these mitochondrial diseases. Thank you. I'm not sure anyone wants to see 80% of our espresso machines shut down. <laughs> All right. Um, I am uh, very happy to introduce you to Dr. Kal Tsanov, who is a postdoc in the lab of Scott Lowe. Um, he is not a real estate agent. He is actually a cancer biologist, but he's going to be talking to us about location, 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 cancer edition. May I please get a show of hands? How many of you have lived in multiple cities? Countries? Me too, by the way. Then you know that even though you were the same person, genetically speaking, same DNA and all, your behavior can dramatically change based on your location. I, for one, substantially increased my pizza consumption after coming to New York. <laughs> now, on a grimmer note, cancers also live in multiple locations. In fact, 90% of cancer deaths are due to metastasis, the spread of cancer from its original location to other parts of the body, such as pancreas to the liver and lungs, as shown here. The so-called stage four metastatic cancers. And yet there is a common assumption that DNA mutations, the errors in the genetic co code that cause cancer in the first place, have the same behavior after they spread to other locations. Same DNA equals same behavior. My research is challenging this assumption. We've made the striking discovery that a single gene called SMAT4, which is very commonly shut off by mutations in pancreatic cancers, 
has diametrically opposed functions in the liver versus lung metastases. We made experimental tumors in laboratory mice where we can switch off or on at will this gene. And when we switched it off, just as in patients, the tumor spread to the liver and lungs. But when we then turned it back on to study its function at this late stage, the liver tumor shrank, but the lung tumors grew bigger. Now, why is this important? More and more cancer therapies are customized to the specific mutations in a patient's tumor, the so-called precision oncology. But there have been puzzling observations where using such therapies in a single patient can lead to tumor shrinking in one organ, but keeping growth in others, overall leading to therapy failure. My research offers a potential explanation to this puzzle and a possible solution where we further tailor our therapies, not just to the tumor's mutation, but also to its location. Because as with pizza consumption, it's not just about who you are, but also where you live. Thank you very much. All right, pizza and coffee. This is a very New York-centric set of talks. All right, um, I would love to now introduce you to uh, Dr. Alexandra Giantini Larson, who is a postdoc in the lab of Vivian Tabar. She's going to be talking to us about combating diffuse midline glioma, hope on the horizon. Good afternoon. September is national back to school month for children ac across the country. However, this year, 300 seats will be empty. Why? Imagine this. You're on your family trip in August to the beach with your children. Your 10-year-old complains of headache and nausea. You don't think anything of it, but out of an abundance of caution, you bring them to the emergency department for evaluation. This is what the MRI shows. To my right, you can see circled in red this large tumor of the pons. It's very large, and you can see on the MRI next to it to my left what the normal size pons looks like. This is what diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma looks like in children. It's now termed diffuse midline glioma. This is a rapidly aggressive, universally fatal brain cancer that affects children. Every year, 200 to 300 children are diagnosed with DIPG, which is located in the brainstem. As we know, the brainstem is vital for essential functions of living, and tumors located in the brainstem cannot be easily removed. After diagnosis, the average time to death is about one year or less. So we are in desperate need of new and novel therapies for this drug. This is why during my neurosurgery residency, I've taken two years to work in the laboratory of Dr. Vivian Tabar at Memorial Sloan Kettering. The Tabar laboratory has identified an oncogenic protein or a protein involved in the formation of cancer for DIPG. It has then, along with the Organic Chemistry Lab and Memorial Sloan Kettering, developed a new inhibitor that helps stop this oncogenic protein from working and hopefully will slow down the growth of DIPG. So to find out if it works, the first thing we did is on patient-derived cells in the laboratory, we gave the inhibitor, and the results were promising. It, in the lab, in the dish, the, slows, the cells stopped growing and some of them died. Our next step, as you can see up here, is we developed a mouse model that had DIPG or the tumor in the pons. And we're directly injecting the inhibitor into the pons and the brainstem of these mice. Our hope is that we will be able to, as you can see in this image, deliver this inhibitor directly into the brainstem of children who suffer from this disease. We are in a race against time for children who are diagnosed over the summer, diagnosed today, and diagnosed tomorrow. As one of the patients I crossed paths with many years ago said, inside all of us is hope. We hope that this inhibitor will help get kids back to the classroom, and that hope is on the horizon. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, I'd now like to introduce you to another clinician um, among us, Dr. Andre Lamarquis, and he is going to be talking to us about how the thymus is beautiful. So the thymus is beautiful. 
Let me tell you why. First of all, what is the thymus? The thymus is an organ situated in your chest, just in front of the heart. The ancient Greeks thought it was the home of the soul. Well, I don't know anything about the soul. But I know it's the home of T cells. That's where T cells are produced. T cells, these major players of our immune system, protecting us every day against infections, autoimmunity, and cancer. Now you might ask yourself, why did he put a picture of his grandmother up there? <laughs> As a child, I used to wander through my grandparents' bookshelves, and I had a favorite book, a book about cells, about the human body, medical devices. And it inspired me to study medicine, and I ended, working, ended up working with children, and children with cancer. Sadly, during the time I was growing up, my grandmother passed away. Like many elderly people, she suffered from multiple diseases, which are due to decreased immune functions. Autoimmunity, multiple infections, cancer. In the elderly, unfortunately, the thymus shrinks, and it can't provide new help, new T cells, new protection. Something analogous happens, actually, in our patients. In our patients suffering from deadly diseases, such as cancer, we need to provide them with life-saving therapies. Unfortunately, some of these therapies are quite harsh, and they hit hard on the thymus. But fortunately, the thymus has also one of the most fantastic capacities of all organs in the human body to regenerate itself. And that's what we study, thymic regeneration. How does it work, and how can it boost that process so that the thymus can provide new protection, new T cells, quicker? I want to tell you, want to tell you about one of the cells that are of special interest right now, recirculating regulatory T cells. So what happens to regulatory T cells when the thymus is injured? Well, when it's injured, recirculating regulatory T cells influx from other sites into the thymus and provide regenerative cues by secretion of regenerative factors and provide help to the surroundings so that T cells can be produced faster. We even seen that we can isolate these cells and provide them to experimental models of the therapy-induced injury and aging. I don't need to tell you that our ultimate aim is to bring some of the knowledge back to our original inspiration to the patients and to the elderly. For patients, you should never underestimate the beauty of saying, you're good to go, you're not anymore at risk. You can go and do day-to-day -day things, spend time with family and friends. And for the elderly, well, I would like to see some grandmothers spending, if not longer lives, but at least lives with better quality of life, spend more time with their grandchildren, that their grandchildren may go through their bookshelves, find books which are the fav their favorites, and get inspired for endeavors of their own. That's why the time is beautiful. Thank you, Andre. I think we all have a new favorite organ. OK. All right. Um, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Carlin Liao, who is a postdoc in the laboratory of Saad Naim, Nadim excuse me, in medical physics. And he's going to talk to us about complex, perplex, and multiplex. When it comes to treating cancer patients, it's often necessary to take a closer look on the inside of each patient. Pathologists do this by taking a tissue sample from the affected area and examining it under a microscope, after dyeing the sample to make it clearer to understand. The most common technique for this is H&E staining, as you can see on my right. Uh, the dye helps you understand where each cell starts and ends to help you better realize that this is probably a cross-section of a lung bronchiole. Techniques like H&E staining have served us well for over 100 years, but more recent developments have made it possible to extract more complex information from each tissue sample. Enter multiplex staining. This technique allows us to dye the same tissue sample dozens or even hundreds of times, with each dye targeting a different cell structure, such as T cells, macrophages, nuclei, and so on. This allows us to tell not just the shape of each cell, but what each cell actually is, giving us a more comprehensive understanding of each patient while minimizing the number of exploratory surgeries we need to do. All this data does come at a cost, since it's hard for even a trained expert to look at 30 different versions of the same slide and understand everything it can tell them. In practice, researchers usually write scripts to aggregate information like, this is where B cells tend to hang out or these are the cell types that are often found next to each other, under a general banner we'll call spatial profiling. But researchers being researchers, they're usually only writing scripts to target their specific study, be it a melanoma retrospective or a new lung cancer treatment, even though a lot of the math is the same, regardless if it's skin on your arm or cancer in your lung. 
This leads to a lot of duplicated effort that could be spent on each individual patient. And this is where our lab comes in. As a team of computer scientists and comp computational biologists, we've been developing a software library that we're calling the Spatial Profiling Toolbox, or SPT, that brings all these metrics together into a single, well-tested, and easily reproducible software library. And for techniques that we've yet to discover, we're also including an artificial intelligence pipeline that can automatically learn from your data to predict if your patient has cancer, if they'll respond to treatment, or anything else you can think to throw at it, as long as you have good data. We've already used SPT to replicate the results of several recent studies from Nature and other large publications, and we're actively seeking new collaborators to get feedback on our work and to make their data a little less perplexing. Thank you. Best commercial so far. All right, thank you, Carlin. All right, um, last but not least today, can you believe we've already gotten to 10? Um, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Annalisa Cornell, who is a postdoc in the lab of David Scheinberg, and she will be talking to us about mastering the game of hide and seek to cure neuroblastoma. Welcome, Annalise. So I would like you all to close your eyes for a second and imagine you're one of the most important warriors of our immune system, a T cell. And when you open your eyes, you have five seconds to spot the cancer cell that looks like a panda today and is surrounded by a lot of healthy snowmen. Go. That's quite difficult, right? Well, this is the same situation for these T-cell warriors in children suffering from the aggressive cancer neuroblastoma. Because neuroblastoma is famous, or maybe I should actually say infamous, for its ability to hide from T-cells. And this is problematic because T-cells are not only able to specifically kill cancer, they're also able to memorize how they look and kill them right away if the cancer would ever reoccur in the future. And they're able to do this by constantly scanning our body, scanning our healthy cells for unusual behavior. And this is facilitated by these healthy cells, here shown as snowmen, by them showing a flag to T cells. And this flag is called MHC1. And in a healthy situation, this flag is green. But the second something is going wrong, for example, a cell becomes infected by a virus or a cell becomes a cancer, this flag may turn red, thereby alarming T cells. However, and this makes sure that in our body, our cells remain healthy. But then, in neuroblastoma, there are two main problems to this. On the one hand, neuroblastoma fails to show this MHC1 flagpole, so it fails to show anything to T cells. And in my research, I've done a lot of research into this, and I found out that we can actually force these neuroblastoma cells, force these pandas, to show this flag by treating them with certain drugs. But then I found out the second problem kicks in, which is that neuroblastoma is a master in pretending that everything is all right. In other words, it keeps showing the green and not the red flag. And in my research, I'm focusing on unmasking these neuroblastoma cells to T cells, not only by forcing them to show this MHC1 flagpole, but also by forcing them to show this red flag. And with this, I believe that we can, neuroblastoma can be killed and remembered by T cells, thereby increasing survival chances for these children. And now I see you wonder, but is she really not going to tell us where the panda is? Well, of course I will. It's right here under the two snowmen with the blue scarves. Thank you for your attention. Nobody thought they were going to be playing Where's Waldo at the postdoc slam, but thank you for that, Annalisa. All right, um, with that, I would like to invite our three judges to please come with me, and I am going to turn the podium back over to Yahara to show you this year's postdoc appreciation video, which hopefully you will all laugh, and we will be back in with the results in a moment.
Thank you, Ushma, and thank you to all of our speakers. I think they deserve another round of applause, please. <laughs> we told you at the beginning that you all were going to help us choose the people's choice, and we are going to go right into this. So to vote, I, you could all get your cell phones out. Um, and you're going to go to this website right here, pollev.com. You're going to type in MSK polls 345. Hopefully that's working. You could also vote by text if that's easier and it doesn't charge you anything. <laughs> and once you get there, maybe a few of you can give me the heads up to move into the next slide. Leave this here for a second. I have my team working hard. Ina, Thaliana, tell me how we're doing here. You in? Not yet? OK, Erin, you're in. Perfect. I'm going to move into the next slide. The instructions is, are at the top if you're still looking what to type in and, and what is it. It's going to list the names of speakers that went through. Hopefully you have those agendas next to you or the person next to you, your, your neighbor has them in case you forget who spoke about what. I could give you a quick rundown. Swathi talked about biological ADT security system, flax cancer cells or immune attack. Zaki talked about harmony behind the noise, how glioma macrophages sing their own tune. Heksha Wan talked about blueprint to disasters. Alarms hijacked by cancer cells. Magdalini Panagia Panagiatokapoulos talk about curing the cure to cancer. Tamarka Flashbili, coffee shops are the powerhouse of New York. Call Sanoff. Location, 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 cancer edition. Alexandria Gentini Larsen, combating diffuse midline glioma, hope on the horizon. Andrew Lemarquis, the thymus is beautiful. Carlene Liao, complex, perplex, multiplex. And Annalisa Cornell, mastering the gain of hide and seek to the cure neuroblastoma. He's not going to show here because he's a screenshot. <laughs> so you won't see who's winning. <laughs> Sorry, I should have said that. Um, oh, uh, Ina is going to help us troubleshoot. So you're going to have to stay with me for a second while we. Uh, yes, let's try the text. Is someone. It's full. How many times are you voting? <laughs> Um, so let's pause here for a second. We'll retake this when Ina comes back. Um, but I kind of want to show you the video, and we'll try the people's choice one more time after we troubleshoot. So bear with me. So for those of you that are unaware of this, every year for the past seven years, we have created a video where we invite sometimes postdocs, all the time postdocs, <laughs> PIs. We have had puppies. We have had kids um, to, to kind of like celebrate uh, the life of postdocs in particular and bring a little bit more of the personas behind who the postdocs are. And this year video, you are the ones, the first ones to see it. Let's take a look. Go team postdocs. Go team faculty. Go team postdoc. Go team faculty. Faculty. <laughs> First up, we have team postdocs. The word is mutation. DNA. Ah, they just <laughs> Restriction. <laughs> Go team postdoc. Sticking with team postdocs. The word is postdoc. Three postdocs. That's it, that's it. <laughs> Go team postdoc. Next up is team faculty. The word is microscope. 
microscopy, imaging, slide, image, uh, image, microscope. Yes. Nice. Go team faculty. Back to team faculty. The word is immunotherapy. Mentor, mentor, mentee, one person, member, lab member, let's get a small, a cell. Cell, cell, cell interaction? Cell, cell, cell therapy? <laughs> Lasers? What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something having to do with, if you know, chemotherapy? No. Immunotherapy. Yeah. 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 Go team faculty. Now back to team postdocs. The word is mouse. Mouse. <laughs> Go team postdoc. Back over to team faculty. The word is fibroblast. Mentor, mentee, pair. Oh, microscopy. Pancreas. Pancreas. Tumor. Oh, oh pancreatic tumor. cancer. Microenvironment. One word. Environment. Environment. Micro. Microenvironment. Micro. Stromal cell. One, one word. Stromal cell. Stromal. Fibroblast. Oh my oh. god. <laughs> Go team faculty. And now for the tie break, team faculty. The word is plasticity. One, one word. You, postdoc, person, trainee, human, scientist, circle, cell, the globe, liquid, Earth. liquid phase separation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, coffee, uh, scientist, a surgeon. lab, uh, researcher. Drinking coffee. coffee, coffee break. What's in there? Water. Oh, major vapor. Spill. Major spill. <laughs> Minor spill. Skin tissue epidermis. A skin container. <laughs> what? Of water slash coffee. <laughs> it was plasticity. <laughs> and the postdocs win it all, four to three. Appreciation Week. I want to publicly thank the three labs that participated, the Tamela Lab, Mara Sherman's Lab, and the Santos Jordana Lab, Luis Felipe, um, Ana Chiara, and Ahom Pao. Thank you so much for being part of the video and being willing to play with us. I hope you like it. We will launch it online tomorrow and we'll send the link to everyone so you can make fun of them and, and tell them that the postdoc won. <laughs> All right. Okay. So now I want to announce the winners of our photo contest. I wasn't expecting this to be <laughs> so like obvious, but I would like to call the winners uh, up to the stage so that I can give them the certificate. On um, first place, we have Cory Haluska from the Zao Lab with sunset serenades over the skyline of ambition. New York paints its dream in golden hues. Cory, if you're around, please join me on stage. All right. Um, the next, uh, the second place goes to Francesca Manara from the Shaudari Lab and uh, Night Lights, Polka Dogs, and a messy lab bench. Uh, Francesca, if you're here, join me on stage. Awesome. Hold for me. And then third place goes to Magdalini in the Heller Lab who on lights, camera, and action. Magdalini is right here. <laughs> Do you want to stand here? He'll take a picture of you. And I think this is you. Thank Perfect. You. I can stand next to you. I don't mean anything. You guys should be taking it though. Excellent. If uh, lab mates of Francesca are here telling her I have her certificate and I might keep it, um, all right? Um, 
And right now, this is a little bit um, an improvisation. We want to sing happy birthday to two of our lab, uh, of our team members, Thaliana and Ina, who Ina's birthday is today, and Thaliana's birthday is tomorrow, so we cannot miss the opportunity to embarrass them in front of everyone. I'll start, but I don't, I, I don't have very good singing voice, all right? So happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Ina and Thaliana. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. All right, and now back to the slam finalists. We uh, we were told that our account on Poll Everywhere had a number, a limit on the number of people who can vote, but apparently we get um, about 65 to 70 votes in, so I will assume that's the majority of the population here. Plus, we had an evident winner from what we were able to see. So I think in, instead of keeping you here until six for troubleshoot that, if everyone is cool, I think we'll honor those votes and we'll pick that people's choice. I won't tell you who it is, though. I, I do know who it is. Um, and it's one of the speakers for sure, all right? <laughs> all right, we are waiting now on the judges to come back uh, on stage. Maybe, you know, you can tell, tell Ushma to, to bring them back. But one more time, this week is all about celebrating postdocs. So if you are here and you see them, celebrate them, honor them. They put a lot of hard hours and hard work in, in making this place spectacular. And I think MSK could not be doing the science that we do without the postdoc. So once again, to every postdoc in the room, this is your week. And more importantly, we want to celebrate you all month. And our doors are always open to you to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly. So please come to us anytime something comes up. But most importantly, continue celebration. Um, we're gonna move into the uh, auditorium in a minute. I'm just waiting on the winners to be announced in order to move there. So I'm gonna have to entertain you for another like 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm running out of things to say though. So it might become awkward really quick. <laughs> or not. All right. I'll go back maybe to the symposium slide at the beginning, and we can talk about what's going to happen on Tuesday. And I'll remind everyone one more time who's our keynote speaker, and that will kill another second or two, for sure. So from the top, for those of you who were not here, we celebrate our postdoc not only in person here with the events, but we also have profiles on 1MSK. This year we have four profiles. Um, Kalf is one of our speakers here, so you saw a little bit of his research, but we also have Miss Eul Park, whose um, profile was published on 1MSK today. Later on the, wheel, on the week, we'll have Carl's profile, then Rebecca, and then Pablo. They all do terrific science, but most importantly, they sat down with our colleagues in communication and share a little bit of their interests and passions and what got them to do science at MSK. Then our colleague, Ina Bachman Sanchez, who you all probably heard of because she is the person who leads the fun fund, have provided and created these amazing Twitter profiles to talk about another 14 postdocs. So go on Twitter. Share the love, amplify their voices, and most importantly, continue celebrating them. And that's the whole team. So I actually run out of things to say. I'll remind everyone, join us on Thursday for the postdoctoral symposium from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. with an amazing keynote at four from Dr. Dr. Valentina Greco from Yale University. It's gonna be an amazing talk plus all of our internal speakers, the list is just phenomenal. So come support them and learn about their science at length. And with that, let's skip through all of this, go back to the end here, and let's talk about SLAM winners. And for that, it is my pleasure to invite Ushma back. All right. Um. That was a fun video, wasn't it? Yeah, very entertaining. I'd like you to think about how you're gonna give the clue plasticity, right? All right, and happy birthday again to Feliana and Ina, right? All right, um, the, and thank you to our three judges um, who helped us come to a consensus. Essentially what they said when we went in there was that you were all absolutely remarkable, and so you should be proud, and they learned a lot 
from all of the different things that are being done here at MSK. So I am going to announce um, everyone is going to come up and get a certificate and we'll all stay up here to take a picture and we will end with the first, second and third prize as well as the people's choice. Um, so if I can please have up here, Hei Shua Wang, thank you. All right, thank you also to Zaki Abumrad. I'm gonna think about you every time I'm in Washington Square. All right, All right. Carlin Liao. I think you're gonna get some collaborators out of today. All right. Everyone's favorite organ, Andre Lamarckey. <laughs> All right. Also, Alexandra Gentini Larson. <laughs> Giving us hope. All right. Tata Kavlashvili. Swathi Jane. All right, so what should we start with? People's choice, third place, second place? What do you think? People's choice? All right. By popular demand, even. Um, I would like to announce that you all voted for Magdalene. Um, and in third place, we have Cal Sanov. All right. So, drum rolls, please, then. In second place, yes, we have Magdalene Panagiotokopoulos. Yeah. Which means our 2023 postdoc slam winner is Annalisa Cornell. So, so impressed by all of you and all of the rest of you postdocs here at MSK. I hope that the rest of you will consider entering next year if you are still here. We love this event. Look at Annalisa, she's like overcome, it's fantastic. We found the snowman or the panda amongst all the snowmen. We're thrilled. All right, so we would love to invite you to please join us in the lobby to celebrate these winners and all of MSK's postdocs. All right, thank you.